In this video, I'm going to talk about the connective tissue disorders that are associated with defects in the formation of collagen type 1, collagen type 2, type 3, and type 4, and then finally, defect in the formation of the fibrillin. But in order to understand some of these disorders, we will first have to go through the pathway through which the collagen is being synthesized. So the mRNA is being transcribed inside the nucleus, and it will be sent inside the rough endoplasmic reticulum, where ribosomes will translate the mRNA into the pre pro collagen and then the pre pro collagen is made of a repeating sequences of glycine where glycine is repeating as every third amino acid residue so there would be glycine two amino acids glycine another two amino acids glycine another two amino acids and so on so these x and y can be any amino acids but they're most frequently being occupied by proline and lysine now, the first three steps of the collagen synthesis are being taken place inside the endoplasmic reticulum. In the first step, there is hydroxylation of the proline and lysines, and this step requires vitamin C. So therefore, patients that have vitamin C deficiency will develop scurvy because now their collagen have problems, and so therefore they develop like bleeding in the gums, ecchymosis, as well as petechias, because there is problem with the hydroxylation step of the collagen synthesis pathway. In the second step, there would be glycosylation of the polypeptide, and then finally, in the third stage, there is a triple helix that is being formed. And in patients that have osteogenesis imperfecta, there is problem with the formation of the triple helix. Now, once the triple helix is formed, it's being sent from the endoplasmic reticulum into the Golgi apparatus, and from there on, it will be secreted into the extracellular space. Inside the extracellular space, the procollagen will be cleaved, so the edges of the procollagen will be trimmed, after which a tropocollagen will be yielded. And then the tropocollagen will be cross-linking together to form the collagen fibrils. And for the cross-linking of the um, lysine and hydroxyl lysine, there is a lysyl oxidase enzyme. So in patients with the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, there is problem with the lysyl oxidase step where there won't be any covalent bond between the lysine and hydroxyl lysine. Now, one other point I would like to mention is that I mentioned earlier that osteogenesis imperfecta is due to the defect in the triple helix formation, and this type of disorder is associated with defect in collagen type 1, while ehler danlos is there is a problem with the formation of covalent linkage between lysine and hydroxyl lysine, and this disorder is associated with defect in collagen type 3, or reticulin. Now back to the table here, osteogenesis imperfecta, as I mentioned earlier, is due to defect in collagen type 1, and there is problem with the formation of a triple helix. Now one memory aid that I have for you is that type 1 collagen is associated with osteogenesis imperfecta. Now characteristics of this disorder include blue sclera. Since the sclera is thin, therefore the choroidal veins are obvious and thus it will give a blue discoloration to the sclera. There are also multiple bone fractures. An example that I can give you is that I had a patient who had osteogenesis imperfecta and she was working in a grocery store. So one example of a fracture that she had was that one of the customers pushed the grocery basket into her hands after which she fractured her hands. So it's as easy as that, like minimal traumas can cause fractures in patients with osteogenesis imperfecta. And then finally, due to the problem with the middle ear bones, they could also develop conductive hearing loss or sometimes mixed hearing loss. So let me show you some images. So here is an example of a blue sclera, where due to the thin sclera that they have, the choroidal veins are evident, and thus there would be blue discoloration of the sclera. There is also problem with the middle ear bones, which includes, for instance, the stapedial fixation, or sometimes the fracture of the stapedial bone, as a consequence of which these patients develop conductive and sometimes mixed hearing loss. And then finally, the third feature of this disorder is multiple bone fractures. The next disorder is due to defect in collagen type 2, which is required for the formation of cartilage. So the memory aid that I have for you is that collagen type 2 is required for the formation of cartilage. So therefore, there's problem with the cartilage. There's also problem with the vitreous body, as well as the nucleus pulposus, both of which are being made of a collagen 2. So let me show you some images. So here we have the intervertebral disc, and we have the nucleus pulposus in the center, which is made of a collagen type 2. 
and then vitriol body is also being made of collagen type 2 and thus would be defective in patients that have problem with collagen type 2. The next disorder is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome which is due to defect in collagen type 3 or reticulin and the memory aid that I have for you is called RED. So reticulin is defective in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, so RED, R-E-D. And the characteristics of this disorder include hypermobile joints, hyperextensible skin, as well as ecchymosis and varicose veins because of the problem with the vessels. So here is an image of a patient with Ehlers-Danlos where you can see that there are hypermobile joints as well as the hyperextensible skin. And then the other features, as I mentioned earlier, include, for instance, ecchymosis, as well as varicose veins. The next disorder is Alport syndrome, which is due to defect in collagen type 4 that is being used in the basement membrane. And the memory aid that I have for you is that collagen type 4 is for the formation of basement floor. So collagen type 4 in basement floor. And then another memory aid that I have for you is that patients with Alport syndrome cannot see cannot pee and cannot hear. So cannot see is because they're having ocular problems. Cannot pee is because they develop hereditary nephritis with the protein urea and hematuria. And then finally cannot hear because they develop sensory neuronal hearing loss. And then the final disorder is Marfan syndrome, which is due to defect in the fibrillin. And these patients present with the tall stature and hyperextensible joints. They also have long extremities. So let's say, that this is a patient, then their arms, you see, is longer than what it's supposed to be. Other features of this disorder include the subluxation of the lenses, upward and outward, as well as cardiovascular defects due to the cystic medial necrosis, and I'm going to explain that in a minute, as a consequence of which patients can develop aortic insufficiency, aneurysms, and aortic dissection. Now, one way you can imagine this disorder is that imagine a patient that is having long arms, lens subluxation, so red eyes shown here, and heart problems. So every time you have Marfan, think of this image that the patient have long arms as well as lens subluxation and cardiovascular problems. And then one other memory aid that I have for you is that Marfan is due to defect in fibrillin. Now in terms of the cystic medial necrosis, the vessels are made of a three layers. Tunica adventitia is the outermost layer, then tunica media, and then tunica intima. And then inside here is where the blood is running. So in patients with the Marfan syndrome, there would be necrosis of the muscles in the tunica media, as well as degeneration of the elastic fibers. As a consequence of which, there would be a cystic space that would be formed in this area. And after which, these patients are prone to the development of the aortic dissection as well as aortic aneurysms. Now, in terms of the presentations, patients with the aortic dissection develop a tearing back pain, and once you measure the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure in the right versus the left arm, you will see that there is more than 20 millimeter mercury difference between the two arms. So let's say that in the right arm, the blood pressure is about 130, and then you check in the left arm, and it's about, let's say, 155. So more than 20 millimeter mercury difference between the right and left arm in patients that have aortic dissection. And then with the aortic aneurysm, it depends where the location of the aneurysm is. If there is an abdominal aortic aneurysm, then you will see a pulsatile abdominal mass and then due to the compression of the nearby organs it could also cause abdominal pain versus thoracic aortic aneurysm which compresses these structures that are up in the thorax and thus these patients can develop like hoarseness of the voice or sometimes paralysis of the diaphragm. All right, now we are done with the discussion of the connective tissue disorders, but before I end this video, there is one last question that I want to ask you, and it's that what infection is associated with defect in the adventitia layer of the aorta? And the answer is tertiary syphilis. So there is a network of the vessels called vaso vasorum which supplies blood to the adventitia layer of the aorta. 
In patients with tertiary syphilis, there is disruption of the vasovasorum, as a consequence of which these patients will develop aortitis due to defect in the adventitia layer. So just keep that in mind. Tertiary syphilis causes aortitis due to defect in the adventitia layer from disruption of the vasovasorum. Versus Marfan syndrome, there is a cystic medial necrosis, which will lead to the aortic dissection and aortic aneurysms. And that concludes our discussion.